Thank you all. Uh, welcome back from lunch. I uh, hope it was a pleasant experience. You had good company and good food. Uh, we're going to resume with the open session agenda here. Uh, Terry Manolio is going to give you a presentation uh, from the Genomic Medicine Working Group of Council. One of the requirements of Council Working Groups is to make, at a minimum, an annual report back to the full Council. And uh, Terry's going to do that for you today. Great. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon. Uh, so this is the probably the fourth report we've done of the Genomic Medicine Working Group uh, to the Council. We try to do them every September. Uh, just a reminder of who's on the, on the uh, Working Group. We have three current Council members, Carol, uh, Howard, and Dan. Um, those of you who are rotating off council, uh, be assured that you're not off the council working group. Um, you'll notice Jeff was on quite some time ago, as was Rex and, and a few others, and yet they're still on our, uh, on our list. So uh, we, we welcome you to, to stick around. Uh, and just a reminder that the uh, sort of the areas that our working group addresses are sort of the latter two domains uh, that were added in the uh, 2011 strategic plan. So the advancing the science of medicine, improving the effectiveness of healthcare is where most of our emphasis is. Uh, the charge to the working group is to assist in advising us on research needed to evaluate and implement genomic medicine uh, by reviewing current progress, identifying gaps, uh, publicizing uh, key advances, uh, planning genomic medicine meetings, which I'll talk about in some detail, facilitating collaborations, and exploring models for um, infrastructure and sustainability of the programs that we propose. So, I think I've described to, to this group in the past that we uh, kind of began this whole effort uh, shortly after the strategic plan was released. It was about June of 2011 uh, when we held a meeting at O'Hare Airport of about 20 different groups that we were aware of were doing implementation of genomics in clinical care. Uh, and we just invited people to come and spend a day with us, um, which they did. Uh, and from that, we, uh, we sort of learned that there was a whole lot more going on than we had expected, but a lot of it was going on in isolation. And one of the things we needed to do was to develop some, some joint uh, um, uh, programs. Uh, we also uh, produced a sort of a roadmap um, from that of how one can go about implementing genomics in clinical care uh, that was published in Genetics and Medicine. Uh, our second meeting, uh, about six months later, was to uh, focus on forming collaborations. We had a third meeting with stakeholders and payers. It was one of many uh, efforts we've had at engaging uh, the payer community and, and others. Um, the fourth was on uh, physician education in January of 2013. Uh, then we had one with federal agencies trying to uh, work with our federal partners to try to to uh, uh, develop strategies for implementation. Uh, the sixth was a global leaders meeting where we invited everybody that we knew in the world as opposed to in the U.S. Uh, to do much of what we had done in the first meeting. Um, and then one on clinical uh, decision support for genomics in medical care. Uh, an eighth one about a year ago uh, that was kind of an overview of our existing programs, just a, a little bit of a step back to see where we are. And we reported on that one, I think, about a year ago, uh, maybe six months. Um, and then just recently held one in April on uh, uh, bedside back to bench that uh, Carol's going to tell you about once I'm finished. Uh, so all of the um, um, meeting our content uh, is, is webcast, uh, everything since the first one, um, and the uh, slides and summaries and all of um, background materials and that are all available on the genomic medicine website. So if you just Google NHGRI genomic medicine, uh, it should come right up. Outgrowths of these meetings, uh, there have been many. Um, probably the, the um, one that uh, came out most immediately was to have a, a meeting that we called Clin Action, which was a, a workshop uh, right around the time of the second genomic medicine workshop, actually two days before, um, that was to try and figure out what variants are actionable, how does one go about uh, determining this, and how can we do it in a collaborative way so that we didn't have 20 different groups doing it 20 different times and coming up with largely the same answers. Uh, that then led to the solicitation for the Clinical Genomics Resource, or ClinGen, that you heard Eric talk about. Um, that has led to a close collaboration with the FDA. Uh, this line is dotted to, so we don't suggest that ClinGen actually produce the FDA. Um, but it, it did uh, produce a, a collaboration with it. Uh, we also, out of that, uh, developed a collaboration with the uh, National Institute of General Medical Sciences in their pharmacogenomics research network uh, to apply a targeted sequencing panel in the eMERGE cohort that we called eMERGE PGX. Um, the second meeting um, led directly to the solicitation for the IGNITE program. 
the third payers meeting uh, is a, a work in progress, uh, but continues to be an effort that we're trying to stimulate. Uh, the fourth led to the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee on Practitioner Education uh, that is now led by our, our Division of um, uh, Education and, and Communication. Um, <clears throat> the fifth one uh, on federal strategies uh, uh, produced collaborations, again, with the FDA and with uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and also uh, produced a trans-NIH working group um, of uh, centers that are, or institutes and centers across NIH that are interested in application of genomics. Uh, I should say that, that, you know, given the conversations that we had earlier today with NHLBI and others, most of the institutes are not doing implementation in clinical care. What they're doing is, is primarily genomics in the biology of disease. Um, and still are, are a few steps away from, from actually applying it in clinical use. So we are sort of out in front on that. Uh, the Global Genomic Medicine meeting led to uh, directly to a workshop on Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, uh, a, a devastating uh, skin reaction to certain drugs in certain uh, genetically susceptible individuals uh, that was identified at the G2MC meeting as being <clears throat> I'm sorry, at the GM6 meeting as being something that we could all coalesce around and actually uh, do a collaborative uh, research and uh, uh, intervention project in. Uh, and that then uh, led to a, a program announcement that was released um, just recently, maybe within the past month or two, uh, for uh, serious adverse drug reactions. And this is a collaboration of about five or six different institutes. Again, these will come in as investigator-initiated applications. They are simply, it describes uh, an interest of, of the various institutes in receiving applications in this area, um, which up until this time there had been relatively few. The uh, decision, clinical decision support meeting uh, led to an interaction with the National Academy of Me Medicine's Genomics Roundtable and their digitized um, uh, electronic uh, health record genomics project. Um, our eighth meeting I, I referred to, and I'll talk more about uh, efforts that are still being developed from that. One of them is harnessing quality improvement efforts, uh, another international education efforts that you heard alluded to by Eric, um, and a third, uh, developing a knowledge base of genomic medicine uh, programs. And it, it led directly to the ninth meeting, the bedside to bench, where there was a, a strong push to get basic scientists more heavily involved in uh, genomic medicine and our planning. And uh, Carol will talk a little bit about uh, a, a outgrowth of that, prioritizing genes for functional studies. We are um, in the early stages of planning for our 10th meeting. We hold these meetings about every 6 to 12 months or so. Um, this one is going to be a, a, a good year after, after the last one, primarily because trying to, to schedule meetings nine months after a meeting in April puts you in the middle of the winter, which makes it challenging. Uh, but at any rate, what we anticipate doing is, is focusing on research directions in pharmacogenomics, particularly as implemented in clinical care. So we would, uh, will be surveying the national and international landscape of these programs, looking for synergies and promoting collaborations as we do in all of our meetings, uh, looking for evidence gaps and, and what's needed to fill them, and then uh, designing some strategies for uh, large-scale evaluation and implementation of pharmacogenomics in clinical care focused on the U.S. Uh, so I thought I'd take uh, most of the time today to talk about what um, GMWG has been doing since the last time you heard about us, uh, and that has been uh, focused primarily on the recommendations from the eighth um, meeting that we held uh, back in April, April of, sorry, that's nine, um, <clears throat> when was it? At any rate, uh, I was in June, sorry, June of uh, 2015. Uh, and as I said, one of the big outgrowths was the, uh, the ninth meeting that you'll hear about from Carol in just a moment. Um, but in addition to engaging basic scientists, we also were encouraged to create an implementation commons for sharing uh, tools for implementing genomic medicine. Um, this was basically affected by the IGNITE program, and we, we sort of had a, a feeling this was on its way. This is the Spark toolbox supporting practice through application resources and knowledge. Uh, currently, it is, it is primarily populated with um, uh, resources from the IGNITE program, but it accepts resources from everywhere, and uh, we are hoping that this will become sort of the go-to place for implementation uh, resources. Uh, we are also encouraged to develop dedicated programs for non-European ancestry populations to fill the gaps that, uh, that we've talked about this morning, as well as many times uh, around this table. Uh, a 
first sort of start on that uh, was the, um, the effort in the Caesar renewal to have uh, centers with enhanced diversity as well as uh, our usual centers, even those centers increasing the diversity that they had typically uh, provided. Um, so this is an, an RFA that is, has now closed, but uh, applications are in and we'll be telling you more about them. This is just a baby step, we think, on, on uh, starting down this road of, of trying to redress some of the imbalances in uh, uh, populations that have been studied and, and uh, work that's been implemented, but we think it's an important step. Um, we were also uh, asked to maximize sharing of quality improvement projects. Uh, there was a, a lot of discussion about the fact that many hospitals are conducting these, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, to explore joint training opportunities with other organizations in other countries, uh, and to establish and maintain a knowledge base of ongoing genomic medicine studies. So looking at the first, the quality improvement projects are conducted by many organizations. Um, they, they are using uh, this sort of model as a, a way of implementing genomic medicine projects. Dan, I believe the Vanderbilt project was, is largely done as a, a QI project, not as a research project. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to doing that. Just as a, a definition, the Health Resource and Service Administration and the National Academy of Medicine des describe quality improvement as a systematic continuous actions uh, that lead to measurable improvement in healthcare services and the health status of targeted patient groups. So, so really improving the quality of healthcare through a variety of venues. Um, such projects typically are individualized to meet the needs of a specific health service delivery system. Uh, they are evidence-based. They are designed to improve patient safety and outcomes, and very often they're complex and multidisciplinary. Um, every, almost every hospital or, or large uh, center uh, conducts these. It's, it's one of the um, uh, ways that one demonstrates a commitment to quality and, and actually in many of the subspecialties there's a requirement for um, continuous uh, quality assessment and improvement. Uh, these are among the groups that, uh, that are engaged in, in this area. The National Quality Forum is one of the, the major national uh, groups. The ISQA, um, International Society for Quality Improvement, uh, is an international group. Um, and uh, the AHRQ, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, obviously funds research in this area. HRSA uh, helps to implement it. Uh, so these are all groups that we are, are working with and trying to coordinate with in, in doing this kind of work. Um, we sort of started out, we thought we'd start small. Um, by talking to having the, the members of the Genomic Medicine Working Group who, had, who were practicing in hospitals or working in hospitals who had quality improvement uh, programs to contact their chiefs and just sort of ask them, are you doing anything in genomics? If so what is it? If not, would you like to? And how could we work together to, to try to, uh, to do this sort of thing? Um, for the most part, those who were doing anything in genomics were doing it because of the Genomic Medicine Working Group members' uh, involvement, so we knew mostly about those. Um, but also there was a, a considerable interest in the potential of, of possibly bringing some of these programs together and, and not only disseminating them to other uh, groups, but also uh, uh, trying to get them to coalesce a bit and, and improve sample sizes for actually doing some research along with the QI. Um, so we're going to start out by organizing a small meeting to discuss the opportunities in, in genomics um, and how we can uh, get other groups interested in those. Um, we, one way would be to, to present uh, genomics seminars at annual meetings of, of these groups. Uh, unfortunately, their, their meetings have either just happened or are about to happen and, and it wasn't possible to get on their agendas, but that's a, a work in progress that we'll be following up on. Exploring joint, joint training opportunities, uh, this kind of came up during the eighth genomic medicine meeting um, when someone described the, uh, very briefly, the in incredible uh, investment that uh, Genomics England is making in uh, genomics education of providers who are going to be receiving basically the results of the 100,000 Genomes Project uh, being conducted in England. Uh, this is an infrastructure building uh, effort to, to actually make um, England, uh, you know, basically genomically enabled for clinical care within the next three years. And it's about uh, 25 million pounds being uh, dedicated to this. Uh, they also have a mandate to share their information and expand internationally. Um, in addition to that program, um, you heard mention of the University of Miami's concurrent Master of Science in Genomic Medicine. This is actually concurrent with the MD degree, so it's uh, students can apply and, and become part of it in their second semester of the first year of medical school and then follow through for four years. I think there are about 40 uh, students now in that program across all four years. Uh, and they've, they just graduated their first class last year. 
the Inner Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education and Genomics, or ISCC, is the one that grew out of the fourth genomic medicine meeting that is run uh, from here and with, in collaboration with the uh, professional societies. Uh, the Jackson Labs has a, a number of valuable resources, including uh, a more, uh, one of their most recent precision medicine for your practice series for education for the non-geneticist uh, practitioner. Uh, and obviously, the ASHG, the college um, and uh, our division of uh, communications and, and education uh, have a number of uh, training programs, all of which we wanted to try to bring together, see where there were synergies, where we could collaborate, share materials, et cetera. Um, so we held a meeting uh, in, uh, in August of, of this year that uh, included the genomics education program. Uh, they have a, a master's program that actually uh, has a number of steps to, uh, to reach the master's at any point in which you can kind of step off and, and uh, receive a certificate. It's designed not only for physicians, but for um, uh, nurses and, and others in the healthcare professions. Uh, and it's available online. They have a, a, a session on sequencing that's, uh, that's actually starting up in a week. Uh, that, that will be available uh, to, uh, and you can sign up, I think. At the time I signed up, there were about 400 people that had signed up for it, and that was a month or so ago. Uh, Australia has the Australian Genome, uh, Genomics Health Alliance, which is basically a national roadmap for the adoption of genomics in clinical care. Uh, they have a fairly uh, substantial program in health education. Uh, Genetics Education Canada has this uh, clever uh, acronym, GECCO, um, and they are doing something similar. This is based in, in Ontario, but their expectation is they will expand it uh, throughout Canada. Um, the G2MC that was a spinoff of our sixth genomic medicine meeting has a series of, of monthly grand rounds that are done by WebEx. Um, these are a little bit challenging to do when you have sites in Singapore and India and um, uh, Britain and the U.S., et cetera. Um, but I think they, they usually happen about 11 at night in the, in the U.S., in the Eastern time zone at least. Uh, and then the University of Miami's program I mentioned to you as well. Um, so you'll be hearing more about this meeting at the February um, uh, meeting. Heather Jenkins will give you a, a summary of it. Um, and many thanks to Heather and Jean Jenkins, our colleague in, in DPCE, for putting this, uh, this program together. Um, we should have a summary of it uh, available very shortly uh, up on the web, and we'll be pursuing uh, collaborative uh, uh, relationships with these uh, other programs that we can tell you about in February. Uh, a third recommendation was to develop a knowledge base of genomic uh, medicine studies. Um, I always cringe when people say, gee, it would be really nice to have a list of all of the things that do X, Y, or Z. Uh, may, many of you may be aware that the, the GWAS catalog started that way, um, that we thought, gee, it would be awfully nice to have a list of who's, you know, how many of these could there possibly be, and there are now, what, close to 3,000 of them. Um, and show no sign of abating. Um, so when people suggest things like this, I usually go and hide, but happily uh, we have Carol Both on our council um, who said, gee, you know, we do something like this in the mouse genome database and you can have people sort of self-nominate uh, and, and it would be very useful to compile information on implementation projects. It would be a good way to stimulate collaboration and uh, more effective evidence generation with larger sample sizes and, and more generalizable approaches, et cetera. Uh, so Carol offered to help us, um, thank you, develop a self-nomination site uh, with some degree of auto-curation uh, that would be modeled on the, the mouse gen uh, genome database and, uh, and on ClinVar, which has a, a similar kind of model. We thought we would begin with just simple project descriptive information, you know, the title and the, and the main aims and the size and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then kind of go from there, see how useful it, it is and how often, how much it, it is used. Um, and we would also encourage submission to other databases that are, are better equipped to be able to handle um, uh, many specifics of, of programs. Clinicaltrials.gov is one of them. Um, and I would hasten to point out clinicaltrials.gov actually is, is, has a, a large proportion, I think more than half, are not clinical trials at all. They're, they're observational studies. Um, and uh, uh, genomic medicine implementation programs, whether uh, trials or not, would fit very well in there. So, so that's another uh, opportunity. So many thanks to Carol um, and to my colleague Cecilia Dupeche who are working on that. And then lastly, uh, one of the things that the uh, uh, working group has done from its inception is to identify sort of notable advances or accomplishments in genomic medicine and make these available uh, on our website for um, largely for us, but also for others when people say, well, you know, what has genomics done for patient care? Well, you know, now there's a list of them. And so if you, if you look on our website, you can see it's, it's divided. Uh, and these are overlapping, so it's a little hard sometimes to decide where to put them. But, you know, clinical implementation, oncology sequencing, et cetera. Um, and then we 
Uh, every month when we meet by phone, we review three or four or five papers that we think are, are candidates for, for this. And sometimes we decide, no, this isn't quite ready yet. And sometimes we decide, yes, you know, absolutely, this should be on. Um, so it includes papers like this one uh, recently published looking at uh, CYP2C19, loss of functional alleles. Um, uh, Dan was pointing out that this is a very nice example of what we were discussing earlier uh, about the value of, of uh, diverse populations, because this study was done in somewhere in the Philippines. I'm sorry, in, uh, in China? In China, I believe. Somewhere in East Asia, forgive me. Um, I'm geographically challenged. Um, but at any rate, uh, and, and they had, there's a, a much higher rate of variant alleles in that population, so they were able to detect a, a very significant impact on, on risk reduction uh, in patients with TIA. The first time this has been shown, the previous uh, positive findings have been in stent restenosis after, uh, uh, after coronary stenting. Uh, this is no another one in practice guidelines from the College of Medical Genetics and Genomics on cancer predisposition assessment, uh, a third on uh, whole exome sequencing uh, tests for detection of point mutations in DILs, et cetera. So, so these are, are something that we try to update um, uh, on a regular basis and, and kind of keep them available for the community to take a look at. So I think I'll stop at that point. I would thank the many people, not only those on the GMWG, but, but also um, those who come to our meetings, who participate either um, uh, in person or, or by phone. Uh, it's always a, a very uh, enthusiastic and lively group. Uh, and of course, all of my colleagues at NHGRI who are involved in GMWG, and then of course, uh, the working group. So I'll stop there and be happy to take questions. Questions for Terry? <clears throat> you overwhelmed them with progress. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What are, what are the thoughts about training um, in, you know, MOOC, for example, fashion, in ways that are much more massively, um, that have a wider reach? Mm. Yes, yeah, so massively open online courses. Yes, yeah, so that's, I, I'm, I'm not saying a course. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just saying using these kinds of platforms that let you, it always strikes me just from the outside that for, especially for computational tools, mm -hmm. less so probably for experimental methods, but for computational tools, this should be, mm -hmm. This should be doable and could reach a much larger number of people. Sure. No, excellent point. It, it isn't something that we have explored in a, in a large degree. And I haven't included the, the Institute's education efforts here because we you know, sort of have those in, there, in the training and education programs. We do have you know, new genomic medicine T32s, but they are very standard. They are not anywhere near the MOOC model. Yeah. No, and I was not thinking about MOOC as training for grad students and postdocs. I was thinking about okay. the community of active researchers of any career phase that need to pick up the new tool, the new thing. Today, they actually still either have to sit at some workshop or figure it out on their own or go to someone next door to train. Mm -hmm. And especially as you think about reaching outside the aficionados, whereas w which is where genomics is going, there's a gap there. So mm -hmm. that's why I asked. Oh, I was just using MOOC as a kind of a sure. metaphor almost. And, and were you also talking, so you just said for researchers, I was wondering if you also were implying uh, another community of people to think about our healthcare professionals around genomic yes, medicine yes, implementation. Yes, yes, and increasingly this would be the case, right, for people right. to be able to Correct. interpret and so mm -hmm. on. So I think the, the uh, people often think about MOOCs in the context of, you know, Coursera and edX serving the undergraduates somewhere else and right. so on. But even that is a misconception of MOOCs. The vast majority of people who actually use MOOCs effectively are people who are extremely well trained. They might have a PhD and a postdoc and they now want to take the cutting edge thing in the something and so they actually go and seek out this training because mm -hmm. they're easy to train, because they know how to study for a class and so on mm -hmm. and they have a huge level of motivation. I think the same would apply mm -hmm. here. There is a lot of demand and there isn't a lot out there and it's, there's a, the amount of time investment that's needed in order to make these materials well is non-trivial, mm -hmm. but if you make the one investment and you have a platform like this, then updating it is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I, I might ask uh, Sharon or Gail perhaps to comment on the, um, uh, the, tool, the report toolkit that's being developed by CSER, but while they're, they're thinking of that, I might also mention the, the um, uh, Genomics England effort actually does make theirs widely available, and that's for, for all practitioners, and there are several resources that our division of, of um, um, policy, communication, and education has developed that are available that way too. Sharon, do you want to comment on the, the CSER effort? Well, I, so I think the toolkit's quite quite different from what 
Aviv was talking about, and I was actually just talking with a relative this weekend who works for Merck, who's doing exactly what you described. Like, she has a very specific issue, and she's been using these kinds of um, online courses for that. So it is, it is something we haven't really thought about, like in the Caesar Consortium or, or that type of thing. What we're developing is more of a point of care, um, uh, which will be hosted actually on the uh, NHGRI um, website for practitioner information uh, education, which is really like if you have a genomic, an exome or genome test report in front of you, what do all these sections mean? Um, and we're like trying to be agnostic to laboratory, so using all the different synonyms that like incidental findings are referred to. But the goal of that is really much more, there are more and more of these reports that are showing up in electronic health records as PDFs, and I get emails from fellows or uh, practitioners in other fields that are seeing the patient and have questions about these. So it's really designed to be kind of try to help someone walk through the different parts of an exome or genome report. Uh, and then have it hosted uh, on the on the web, and then the dissemination will be the critical issue. But I think that the idea of MOOCs um, is important. And, and one point of the dissemination is once we really get it up and test it and beta test it, would be to try to ask if laboratories would you know include the link, for example, on their test report. I just wanted to say yeah, we I, <clears throat> we no. put together a MOOC like that from UCSF that ran for two years. And, I, and there a couple lessons I learned from it. It was it was for non-genetics clinicians uh, and healthcare providers, not necessarily MDs. Uh, is that the impact on the international scene is even greater? Uh, the, the, this is tremendous uh, need for um, web-based uh, learning for people that are not in, you know, three or four countries that do a lot of genomics. It's really incredible. We, they, they're the people we kept getting emails from saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. Yeah, and I think a, a, an important point right, right now with the data that are being, being collected with CSER is that, you know, CSER is a research project, and it's obviously oriented toward moving into the clinical clinical care, and but that research clinical interface is being is thought of really differently across all of the projects. And so... Well, I think that what Sharon said is absolutely right, that that's what's, you know, it's the point of care. And several of the studies are looking at the ways that non-genetics clinicians are grappling with the information. But there's also the issue about um, what the participants, how the participants are responding and what they do and what they think about the kind of information that they're being told and the reports that they're being given and sort of who's in charge of that, because I think a lot of them then take those right back to other practitioners. So there is also that participant slash patient um, stakeholder, if you will, who's in there and complicates things. Um, Aviv, the other, um, the other thing worth mentioning is what Terry's representing through this Genomic Medicine Working Group of course, is, is sort of the extramural research programs portfolio around genomic medicine. Um, the other place at the Institute, and you heard me talk about it in some of the slides in my direction, the other part of the Institute that thinks a lot about um, healthcare professional education engagement, also general public, um, is are two different branches within the Division of Policy Communications Education, which is not part of the, the extramural research program. And there are a number of things brewing there that probably are premature for me to talk about quite yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the coming months or future council meetings, which might be able to um, capitalize on some of the ideas. In fact, it's probably more, I mean, if we needed to have research done, it probably would be done within the context of this working group, this council, and so forth. But if, if, it's, if there are things that could be done and we just need to materialize or, or lead it or catalyze whatever words you want to use, it, it would be... I'm sure a partnership that would certainly involve Terry's branch, I mean, Terry's division and her expertise, their expertise, but also other parts of the Institute, which is like where the Smithsonian exhibition came out of, other educational programs, some of our short courses, et cetera, et cetera, two parts of the other division that are quite focused on that. And as it's probably the genesis of your question is there's a, an incredibly acute need for this. And so I think there's a bigger role I'm looking to see NHGRI play, and it'll probably involve many parts of the Institute. I have a question for Bob. How many people did you get in your course, Bob? Uh, now, 
8,000 co- wow. signed up for it. So I only have 6,500 in mine, which is still running, yeah. called Case Studies and Personalized Medicine. I had to advertise somehow. I agree with Aviv. I mean, I, you know, it's, 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 an, it's, it's a gigantic pain in the <coughs> rear no to do it. Um, and I, and I, I just sent Terry the link, I, and, I, and my comment was, it, two years worth of my gastric lining went into that link. Um, and if I had it to do again, I would, I'm, I'm smarter now and I know how to do it better. But I, I think with all the, the audiovisual support that NHGRI uh, has and has invested in, it, it seems like a reasonable thing to think about. Uh, I mean, that's what it takes. I mean, you have to have a TV studio and, a, you know, you have to have all this stuff, which you guys have. Case studies in personalized medicine with a Z, not with an S. The S takes you to some Australian site. <laughs> Actually, I, uh, the one thing I, I would slightly, I think if we were going to do this and do it well, I'm not sure it would be done internally to the Institute. We would, we could facilitate having it done. We'd probably want it done really well. It would require probably real professionals doing this, not just people in their spare time at the Institute. So I also want to make the distinction between a full MOOC, which is what Dan was just describing, and I couldn't agree more. It's a huge amount of, it's just endless amounts of work to take even a class that you taught extremely well for years and, and is fully up to date and make it work in this format. But in particular for computational analytics, you could do, you could think kind of in a mini MOOC format. They, they tend to fall into these little recipes or steps or so on. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take a singular um, large-scale endeavor and you could still get quite a lot of uh, bang for the buck. So if I think of something, it's just off the top of my head, like in a variant interpretation, in, in administ even an administrative supplement to some of the groups that already do that so that they make a module, not a big class, a module, a piece. But that piece explains something very well, even a tool that they already developed, such as a variant interpretation, this or that or the other. So I think there, it, it, that's why I said MOOC in the more metaphorical sense, not just we take our class at MIT or at Harvard or at Hopkins or something and we make it into a MOOC, which is a bigger thing to do. Okay, Terry, thank you very much. I think uh, Terry has uh, set the stage quite well for Carol. Um, she's going to come up and talk about uh, Genomic Medicine 9 meeting. <laughs>